Good morning. It's my privilege to be in, here and to share with you today. And I want to talk to you today a little bit about wisdom from a father and wisdom from his son. But let me begin uh, with a word of prayer. Would you join me as we pray? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Father, give us open ears to hear what you have. Give us open hearts to hear and help us look at ourselves as we look at wisdom from the scriptures. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for what you will continue to do in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. We're going to talk a little bit about David and Solomon today. But I'd like to start off with a, something from Andy Stanley, a pastor in the Atlanta area. A Andy wrote one of my favorite books. It's called Principle of the Path. And in this book, he gives a principle that affects every part of our lives. And that principle is this, direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. You know, for all of us sitting here, our eventual destination, one day we want to stand before God himself and hear from him, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the destination. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we going into a, in a direction that takes us to that destination? And I'd like to take two people in scripture, David and his son Solomon, and see what they had for wisdom. I'd like to begin by reading a passage that's very, very familiar, just three verses that really describes David and his entire life. And it's found in Psalm 1. It goes from verses 1 through 3. Now, David, as he's writing this, he oftentimes writes and he talks about righteous people versus wicked people. And it's assumed that he's talking about righteous people as he starts here, because in verse 4, he says this, not so the wicked. So he's talking to us as righteous people. And he says this, and I would take the, these three verses and break them up and talk about how it affected David and his wisdom. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. You know, David starts off here talking about something that can happen in our lives, and he says, blessed is the man who does not, and he talks about three different things, walk, stand, or sit. You know, when sin enters our lives, it is a downward progression. It happens always in a downward progression. Sometimes it happens very slowly. Other times it's quickly. But you know, sin is really subtle in our lives. You know, if you wanted to boil a frog, you can put a frog in a pan, a cold, uh, pan of cold water, put it on the stove, turn the heat on real low, and that frog will just sit in there and sit in there and eventually just get cooked. But you know, if you have put that pan of, and you make it boiling water and you throw the frog in, he's going to jump out. See, that subtleness of in there allows the frog to get cooked. And sometimes that's what sin does in our life. And David says this, watch for the downward progression. See, David himself got caught in that downward progression. We all know the story of David, David and Bathsheba. You know, David went out and he looked, he desired, and he fell. You know, we're coming up on the Easter season real, uh, real quickly, and we all know the story of Peter and how he denied Christ. And we see Peter on the night before Jesus is crucified. He comes, and we see him in Luke chapter 22. He's walking, he stops, and he goes and sits down, and then he denies Christ. It's a downward slide that we can get caught in. And David says, be careful of the downward slide. But he actually starts off this verse with a very interesting word. And he says, blessed is the man. Now, Evan talked about two of his areas in Philadelphia sports where he was blessed. You know, we just watched the Philadelphia Eagles. And people can look and say, man, there's so many outstanding Christians on that team. God really blessed them because of what they did. And so that's why they won. They were really blessed. And in fact, in a Western culture, when we look at the definition of blessed, we says it's something you have good fortune or you have a desired outcome or you have comfort. You know, oftentimes when I'm at, people ask me about our company, I say, we really have been blessed. But you know, when David uses the word blessed and we see blessed in the scripture, that's not really what it's talking about. It's not talking about just having good outcomes. And in fact, it says that it, 
the definition as we would look at this in the scriptures is to be fully satisfied in God. And it's not based on our circumstances. You know, we were probably all cheering on the eagles, but what if they would have lost? Would they still have been blessed? The answer is yes. You know, it sometimes happens to us in business. We are still blessed in spite of our circumstances. But then David comes and he gives a little bit of secret. In verse 2, he says this, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You know, people who are righteous delight in the word. We enjoy getting into the scriptures, and we enjoy getting that. But, you know, he talks about the secret, and that is meditating on the word. He says this, he said, um, he meditates day and night. We oftentimes don't understand what meditation really on the scripture is really all about. So let me give you an illustration. Let's say you and I decided we're going to go into parts of Pennsylvania and we're going to get on the Appalachian Trail and we're going to hike the Appalachian Trail. And as we're hiking the trail, we're getting kind of tired. And we look at our map and said, oh, up here comes a little town. Let's go down the town and see if we can get some energy. So we get off the trail and we go down to this town and we find a little general store. And as we go into that general store on one whole wall, is all kinds of candy, but this store is something really unique. In the corner, it has a cotton candy machine. Now, you all know what cotton candy is. You know, you just take a bite. Boy, that sugar rush gets you. It gives you no nutritional value, but it sure gives you a lift, and it just tastes so good. But it doesn't sustain you for the journey. But on the other walls, all kinds of snacks, and one of the snacks that's over there is beef jerky. And, you know, some of you may or may not like beef jerky, but, you know, beef jerky, you take a bite, and you chew, and you chew, and you chew, and you chew. And as you start chewing, the protein starts to come out. It starts to give you energy, and it gives you energy for the journey, and it sustains you as you go along. And what he means to meditate here is think of beef jerky. When you get scripture, when you have your morning devotions, and you have something that God speaks to you all day long, chew on it chew on it. Don't go like cotton candy where you just take a bite. Oh man, that tasted good. And we'll go on from there. And it doesn't do anything for you. Learn to chew on the scriptures. But then in verse three, he gives us something else that's really, really important. He says this, he's like a tree planted by the streams of water. Being planted is you're intentionally put into a place. And David said, if you're going to learn wisdom, you're going to be intentionally. You know, are you at a place in your life and when you get onto your career, are you a place where God placed you? Evan was telling me about how God placed him here at uh, Cairn University. He took him out of industry and he placed him here, intentionally placed. For all of us, are we intentionally placed? Because when we're intentionally placed, here's what happens. He says in the next part, yields its fruit in its season. See, it isn't just that you're right in the right place, but you're yielding fruit in its season. In Matthew, we read that by your fruits, you're going to know them. When you're intentionally placed where God wants you to be, you will be fruitful. But he says, next thing is, the leaf does not wither. It's fully nourished. You know how that nourishment comes? We actually saw it in the verse before that. By meditating on the scriptures, you're fully nourished. Because when the storms of life come, And I will tell you this, every one of us will face storms of life. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And what happens when the storms of life come? Will your leaf wither or have you really been placed, have you been planted by a stream where you're really nourished? But then he ends up with this last word. He says, whatever he does will prosper. He, He prospers. What does the word prosper mean? Again, from the Western uh, society, we always, hey, we're well off. It's really, we're really well off. Well, you know, when scripture says the word prosper, that's not what it really means. The word prosper here really says is everything works for God's good, no matter what the circumstances are. So if we take a look at what David has to say, we can learn from his wisdom that this, number one, we need to be, we are fully satisfied in God and it doesn't depend on our circumstances. We're blessed. We need to walk with him. It's easy to get off track and get into that downward spiral, but we need to walk with him by doing this, being in his word daily, and chewing on it, and chewing on it, and chewing on it. Fourthly, 
We need to be where he wants us to be. We need to be intentionally planted. And lastly, even though we may have difficult circumstances coming into our lives, God will have it all work out for his good and we will prosper. Well, you know, one of the things as we look at scripture, we look at David, he's the only person in all of scripture that says this about him. He was a man after God's own heart. How do we learn that about David and where his heart was? Well, if we take a look at how he became king, the second king of Israel. Israel wanted to have, they wanted to be like all the other nations, and they wanted to have a king. And so they chose Saul as their first king. Well, Saul did well in the beginning, and then he went on to his own way. He moved from being a serving leader to being a self-serving leader. And God said, you're disqualified. And he said, Samuel, I want you to go out and I want you to anoint a new king. And as we read in uh, the, the account, Saul, Samuel's kind of shaking in his boots. Well, you know, if the king finds out that I'm going out to anoint a new king, he's going to kill me. And God says, Saul, I mean, Samuel, I want you to go to the town of Bethlehem to find a guy named Jesse, because one of his sons is going to be the new king. So Samuel goes out and so what am I going to tell the people? Well, I'm here for a sacrifice. So he finds Jesse. And, he's, and uh, now Samuel, okay, my job's going to be pretty easy. Sam, uh, Jesse, will you bring your sons together? Because I want to have a sacrifice with them. He says, okay, God, I'm ready. And I know our tradition. It's always the oldest son. See, the oldest son was the one who always got the birthright. The oldest son always got the blessing. The oldest son got the entire inheritance. And so the oldest son came out, and Samuel looked at him, and God said, no. And he said, Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And after six of Sam, uh, Jesse's sons come, no, no. Jesse, do you have any more sons? Well, my youngest one, he's out taking care of the sheep. Can you have him come in? And as he's coming... God tells Samuel, this is a man after my heart. And so we look and say, if we want to really have the wisdom that David had, would God say us that we're a person after his heart? But see, then we take a look at when David was ready to not be king anymore. You look and say, well, his oldest born son should be the new king. If I'd ask most of you, who was his oldest born son? Many of you wouldn't know. That's Amnon. But you know, as we read the story of, of David and his family, Amnon went and raped his sister, Tamar. Another brother, Absalom, came and killed him. And so David couldn't pass the kingdom onto his oldest son because of the things that happened. But the king that would follow would be Solomon, who was the second born son of him and Bathsheba. And, so, and God told this to Solomon, because your father was a man after my own heart, Solomon, you ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon came, and we know the story, he asked for wisdom and knowledge. And God said, since you ask for those things, I will also give you something you haven't asked for, wealth and honor. So I want to get some wisdom now from the son and go to Proverbs chapter 3 and two verses that are really familiar to all of us, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In fact, I probably could say let's quote them in, in unison, but I'll read it to you. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your pathway straight. So the first phrase in that, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord. But you know what we oftentimes do? We change that verse slightly. And we say, trust our heart. See, if we trust in the Lord, that means we place our confidence in God only. But if we trust our heart, it's very different. See, Jeremiah told us this in Jeremiah 17, 9. He says, our heart is deceitful and desperately sick. And all of us have desperately sick hearts. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, do you ever get involved in self-talk where you tell yourself something that you need to do? You know, maybe for you, you have a major exam coming up tomorrow. 
And you know, you tell yourself, I'm going to study tonight. I'm going to take whatever, I'm going to study all night just to be ready for that test tomorrow. But one of your friends comes along and says, hey, there's something happening on campus tonight. Everybody's going to this. And you say, well, everybody's going to it? So you do some self-talk and say, well, you know, I know I need a study. But brain, can you come up with an idea of why I shouldn't be studying tonight? Uh, I'll tell you what. You're get up, you'll get up real early tomorrow morning, and you'll study extra hard. And, you know, it'll be really fresh because I'll have it right then. You know you hate getting up in the morning. And besides that, you have an early class that you can't cut. But, you know, you tell yourself a lie, and you believe the lie. See, that's what our heart oftentimes does to us, and that's what Solomon's saying here. See, it happened to his father, David. We know the story of David and Bathsheba. David went out and stood on his rooftop. Nothing wrong with that. Went out, stood on his rooftop. He saw this beautiful woman, woman bathing. And his heart says, I want her. Brain, can you come up with a reason why, you know, why, why I can't have her? Well, you know, you're the king. You can have anything you want. So, and nobody's going to know. So he calls his servants over and says, hey, do you know who that woman is over there? Well, we believe that's Uriah's wife. So David goes to his brain. Can you come up with some really reason, good reason? Well, Uriah is out in battle. Yeah, it says in the, the passage before that David, when the kings went out to war, David stayed home. Notice the downward spiral that's going to happen here. And David said, I want him. And he said, so, you know, tell the servants, bring her over here. Anybody tells anybody, they get killed. Nobody's going to know. In fact, his brain tells him, listen, David, you have done so much for God. Do you know how many people you've killed, what you've done, your lifetime? You kind of deserve this. It's a downward spiral. So Solomon says this. He says, don't trust your heart because Jeremiah tells us our heart's deceitful. But we still trust our hearts. But So what Solomon really is saying here, don't trust your heart, but trust God with your heart. Place your confidence in God alone, and don't let your heart lead you astray. So his second phrase there he talks about is don't lean on your own understanding. You know, this word lean is kind of like the word being propped up. See, when we lean on our own understanding, we see things the way that we want to see them. Solomon says we need to see the things the way that God wants to see them, and the way God views them, not the way we view them. See, he's really telling us, you know, if you think you're really good and you're really trusting your heart, don't believe the self-talk. Because if you trust God with your heart, you'll be able to defeat that self-talk. You know, here's Solomon, <clears throat> the wisest man who ever lived, talking to himself. He knows that us as, human, as humans have the propensity to see things the way we want to see them and how they feel to us. And we can talk ourselves out of anything through self-talk. He's reminding us also here that we should make the mistake of thinking that we're wise enough, we're smart enough, or we even experienced enough to lean on what we think. We need to see what God wants from us. And verse 6, he actually completes this thought. He says in verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your pathway straight. You know, we don't use the word acknowledge too much these days. You know, when's the last time you say, I acknowledge you? In reality, when we take a look at the word acknowledge here, it would be better to be read submit. In all your ways, submit to him. So how do we submit to God? Well, first of all, we recognize who he is. And then we respond accordingly. See, the proper response to God is the same as leaning on him. It's submission. We need to submit even on the small decisions of life not just the large ones. So what happens when we don't trust ourselves, but we trust wholeheartedly on what God has and in submission to him, we have this phrase here at the end that doesn't seem to make, make sense. He'll make your pathway straight. What does it mean to have your pathway be made straight? Is it saying that as you go through life, you're going to have a straight road? That's not what it's saying. Will he take out all the hills and valleys? No, he's not saying that. He's saying this, that when you're willing to follow his plan, he'll make the decisions very obvious for you. See, it's trust God with your heart. 
Don't lean on what you think. Submit to him, and he'll make the decisions. You know, and you're going to be faced with many, many life decisions. But this is something I've used in business over the years, and this has helped me make the right decisions. Let me give you a true life example of a business I was working with. I get to work with family businesses all over the world, especially ones that are struggling. I happen to be working with a business in Columbia, South Carolina, two brothers who got the business from their father, and they ran that business for 50 years. And they were coming close to the end of their career, and the oldest brother's son came into the business. Now, he was really a good guy, but when the son came into the business, it took these two brothers. In fact, they used to go to dinner together with their spouses three times a week. They were super close. But when the son came into the business, all of a sudden, things weren't the same. Their conversations changed drastically. So about three years ago, they asked me to come down and sit and see if I could help them iron this out. All strong believers. I sat down with them and worked through some things and gave them some things to work on. About a year and a half later, they called me up and said, Phil, still not going good. We think we need to sell the business. So I helped them go through some processes and we actually ended up getting one of the large accounting firms that got across the country who made up a book to sell the business. And the accounting firm came in and said, we wanna put it out to 250 of our clients and we'd hope you get at least $14 million in selling the business, maybe up to 16 million if you really get a great offer. We're gonna send it out and expect to get 25 bids back. Well, I had gone over them with this verse and I said, you know, as we put this out, Are we going to get to the point in time where we trust God, what he's going to do? We're going to submit to him. And God, we're going to ask you to make this decision really clear. Well, bids started coming back and they got three bids. The first bid was for $8 million. Wow, I thought we were supposed to get at least $14 million. Second bid came in was $22 million. Wow. The third bid was $20 million. So they threw out the first bid and they worked with the next two bids. And the, those companies, then, the, the bidders had a 30-day process where they could come in and get much more information about the company. And they said, Phil, how are we going to f- do this? I said, you know, do you really believe what God says, that he's going to make this decision really clear for you? Well, after the 30 days were up, the one company that bid $22 million came back and said, you know, we're going to hold our bid at $22 million. But the company that bid $20 million, they didn't hear anything back. They, this company was in asking a whole lot of questions. They seemed really interested. And they had a deadline of 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And at 5 of 5, the uh, oldest brother called me back and he said, Phil, we haven't heard back from them. What do we do? I said, do you believe God's going to really show up here? I said, uh, let's just wait. Yeah, but in five minutes it closes. Just wait. He waited an hour. An hour later he called me at 5 of 6. And he said, Phil, he said, we just got a call from this guy. And he said, uh, he put a bid of $28.4 million for the business. Not only that, he wants our leadership team, of which my son is there, and because the son wanted to stay in and work in the business, he wants them to stay in the business and to lead the business, and he wants them to have a 10% ownership in the business. I said, do you think God made this decision pretty clear? But you know what happened in the next week? They all suddenly looked and said, boy, we got a whole lot more for this business than we thought. And you know, what Solomon starts off in this, and he says, don't trust your heart. Well, our hearts still went back and started saying, you know, why did we get such a high bid? Maybe I need more money because of what I'm doing. Or I'm doing because of what, and all of a sudden, they went back into a fight. Now, I was in a process, so I was working. My dad had gone into, I, the day of the final bids, I put my dad into hospice care. He was 95 years old, and we knew his time was short. So a week later, they called me up and said, Phil, Can you fly down for just a couple hours to sit down with us and to help us go through this process? I said, I'll do this. But he said, here's the problem. I said, we'll wait. And if at the end of, uh, if if my dad doesn't die this afternoon, I'll come and, and do it. Well, I flew down there and I said, let me ask you this. Why do you think God blessed you? And we went through a whole process of how they could take this blessing and actually take it out to each other and give it out to their, their employees how, what to do with the leaders. So I want to come back and say, what decisions are you facing in life? You know, if you look in the mirror, are you really trusting God about your decisions? See, Solomon tells us this, don't trust your heart, trust God with your heart. 
See things the way God wants them, not the way we want them to be. Submit to him in all areas, and he'll make the decision obvious. Wisdom for us. But let me close and remind you what I started with. Direction, not intention, determines destination. Are you take, going in a direction that are going to lead to that? How can you use the wisdom we learned from David and Solomon to help you in your life? See, Andy Stanley wrote another book that I really like, and I encourage all of you, if you haven't read it, the book's called Ask It. It used to be called The Best Question Ever. And in this book, Andy asks the question. And the question he asks is, every decision you make in life, ask one question. Is this the wisest thing? See, you know what our heart tells us to ask? So what's wrong with this? See, our heart's asking to ask a question that's going to lead us in a different path. So I want to challenge you as you go out and any decision you have to make today or your career or your life, what you're doing, always ask this question. Is this the wisest thing? David and Solomon have given us wisdom for living life. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the wisdom you give us from David and from Solomon. Father, and I pray that we would see ourselves planted by streams, that we would be chewing on your word. And Father, we would take the wisdom that Solomon gave us to not trust our heart, but trust you with our hearts. Father, that we wouldn't lean on just what we think, but really submit to you in every area. And as you've promised, you will make the decisions really clear. Father, we're leaning on you today. And as we go forward, help us to be willing to ask that question every day. Is this the wisest thing? Thank you for giving us your wisdom that we can live our lives daily. For it's in your name we pray and ask these things. Amen.